In the previous video, we proved that every cyclic group is up to isomorphism determined by its order. There's only one cyclic group for every possible order you could consider, uh, both finite and infinite. Well, what about other families of groups? Could we classify finite abelian groups up to isomorphism, just like we did with cyclic groups? And the answer is yes. Um, Finite abelian groups will be determined up to isomorphism as direct products of cyclic groups. And that's something we'll do later on in this chapter, not in this lecture right now. Um, the question of classifying finite non-abelian groups up to isomorphism is a much bigger task. Um, up to the present, this is not done. Uh, in fact, the sort of the, the, the state of the art is that only within the last few decades have group theorists been able to classify finite simple groups up to isomorphism. Um, which the simple groups, a term we'll define later on in this lecture series, not in this lecture though. Simple groups you can think of as the atomic building blocks of finite groups. And so we've only barely determined all of the atoms on the periodic table. Uh, coming up with molecules is gonna be much, much more difficult. Um, even classifying finite P groups uh, is still a very, very unsettled question in group theory. And so these topics take us way beyond what you would see in a first semester algebra class. Very important topics, uh, but we would be insufficient to be able to prove them right now. In the meanwhile, though, we will prove the very first so-called representation theoretic theorem of group theory, known as Cayley's theorem. I've, I've sprinkled here and there things which I refer to as representation theory, but Cayley's theorem is really the first uh, the first step towards representation theory, which as I've many times in the past has said that representation theory is like equipping group theory with linear algebra. Uh, the way we're going to try to mention it right now is representation theory, a very active research branch of group theory. Uh, it aims to represent abstract groups as more familiar groups, such as cyclic groups, permutation groups, matrix groups. We could call these concrete groups. Um, and so the advantage of representing a group uh, as a group of matrices allows one to employ linear algebra in the study of groups. Uh, by representing a group as a permutation group, we can use things like combinatorics and group actions to help us better understand the abstract group. So uh, similar benefits exist for representing abstract groups as other concrete ones. So Cayley's theorem, uh, which we will prove in this video, allows us to represent every group as a permutation group. Uh, this is a very useful result in many situations. In some regard, it's like almost too useful that we actually never have, know how to use it. It's like that, that perfect gift you got for Christmas, but it's so perfect. You don't know what to do with it. I, I know that might not make any sense, but what it, what, it, what it basically means for us is that if you can prove something about the symmetric group, it's almost like the holy grail because in some respect, it proves it about every group. And because of that, it almost becomes too grand to prove certain things because otherwise you cover all groups at the same moment. So I digress. Let's prove Cayley's theorem in this video here. We're gonna prove, we're gonna do it in parts. There's two lemmas I wanna prove first because uh, the lemmas actually have some broad ranging consequences. Uh, and then we'll prove Cayley's theorem uh, as following those two lemmas. The first one, essentially we've already proven it in this series many times, but we're gonna prove it officially right now. Let G be a group with an element little g inside of it. Uh, then we're gonna define a map. We're gonna call it land of G, which is gonna be a map from G to G. And it's going to be given by the rule lambda g of x equals g of x. So this is the left multiplication map by g. Or as I've referred to it in the series earlier, this is the left translation map. All right, translation. I ran out of space there. Um, analogously, we could talk about the map rho of g of x, which would be defined to be x times g. This is called right translation. And I want you to be, I want you to convince yourself that everything I'm going to say about left translation, the analogous statements could be said, said about right translation. But we're going to focus on left translation right here. Again, just for the sake of argument, we need to pick one. So in this lemma, we're going to prove that left translation by G is a permutation. So what is a permutation after all? It's a map from a set back into itself. So the domain and codomain are the same. We have to then prove this is a bijection. So it's not, a, it's not too difficult of an argument. Let's go through it. So we have to show that phi of G is bijective for any element G. G will be arbitrary so that when we prove it for G, we'll take care of everything at the same time. So let's take two elements inside of the group, X and Y, which might have nothing to do with little g. And let's suppose that their images are the same. We want to prove that it's one to one. So lambda of g of x is e assume that's equal to lambda g of y. 
Well, by definition, that means you're going to get gx equals gy. But as we have a factor of left on both sides, we can cancel the x and uh, the, the g, excuse me, we get x equals y. So cancel, left cancellation shows that this map will be injective. Now, if this was a finite set, you'd be like, oh, an injective set here would have to be surjective at the same time. But I wouldn't want this argument also to apply to infinite groups. So we need to supply an uh, argument for surjectivity. Well, okay, imagine you have x. This is our target. Who's going to map onto little x? Well, we're going to take g inverse of x. Well, notice that lambda g of g inverse of x. This will equal g times g inverse of x, which equals g, g inverse of x, which equals x. And so this is going to turn out to be surjective. And therefore, lambda g is a permutation. It's both injective and surjective. And like I said, we could also talk about these. the same argument would have worked for right translation, um, which you'll actually notice that rho g of x I defined. Despite what I said earlier, I actually could say x g inverse. There's a little bit of advantage of doing an inverse sign there. Uh, but don't worry about that too much in this conversation. Again, we're going to focus on left translation. Now, the, 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 this, uh, this, this G inverse is really comes into play if we want to talk about the regular representation, the right regular representation. The, what I said earlier about timesing by G, that right translation, that uh, would also, that also would turn out to be permutation. It's just later results would be more useful to have this G inverse. And that's because we're not, we can't assume the group is abelian. Um, I want to illustrate this as an example before we go on to the next lemma. Let's take the cyclic group of order four uh, with respect to addition, of course. And so you have the elements 0, 1, 2, 3, uh, and 0, 1, 2, 3. You see them like that. If I were to highlight a row of the Cayley table here, so we have the zero row. If you look at that, what does that mean? So zero will send zero to zero, one to one, two to two, three to three. And so we end up with the permutation, which turns out just to be the identity. Okay, if we take the next row, if we take the first row, notice the first row sends one, 0 to 1, 1 to 2, 2 to 3, and 3 to 0. For which if we just record that right here, like if we just record the index row with row 1, that actually is the permutation in question right here. For which we can then write that with cyclic notation. The 0 goes to 1, goes to 2, goes to 3, goes back to 0. Okay. Um, if we do this again for the second row, so we take our index row and we take the second row, this gives us the permutation 0, 1, 2, 3. Well, that's just the index. 0 goes to 2, 1 goes to 3, zero go, 2 goes to 0, and 3 goes to 1. So we get this permutation. It's a 2, 2 cycle. 0 and 1 are in an orbit. 1 and 3 are in an orbit. And then finally, if we take the third row, we see that 0 goes to 3, 1 goes to 0, 2 goes to 1, and 3 goes to 2. And so here's the 4 cycle, 0, 3, 2, 1. So we can represent, uh, we can represent this, uh, these permutations by really looking at the Cayley table and seeing, oh, the row, the rows in the Cayley table correspond to these, uh, to these permutations. Now with our right, right or with our right, a representation here, row of G. Remember, you're supposed to take the inverse. It's kind of like looking at the columns of this, but again, you have to take inverses. Again, that's a subtlety that we'll worry about a little bit later. So let's look at our second lemma right here. Let G be a group. We're going to define a new set. We're going to call it G bar for the lack of a better name. Take G bar to be the set of all left translation maps. Okay, and I claim that G bar is a subgroup of... SG. Now, technically, this should be SG, really, right? Because um, we're talking about permutations on the set G. But these permutations up to isomorphism, it only depends on the size of the set. So I can identify, I can say this is S sub G, the order of G. So it's just a number. So don't worry about that, that nuance so much right there. So I claim that G bar is a subgroup. So we have to show it has the identity. It's closed under multiplication. It's closed under inverses. All right. So let's first show that we have the identity. Well, our candidate, notice over here, G, it has an identity element because it's a group. Uh, so let's take left translation by the identity. Notice if you take left translation by the identity, that'll just, so lambda E of X will just be EX, which is just X, which is just the identity map, right? X was, didn't matter here. And so the left translation by the identity is the identity permutation. And so therefore we have the identity of the symmetric group. So G bar has an identity. Great, that's step number one. We have an identity. Uh, next thing, we need to show it's closed under multiplication. Okay, well, let's take two elements of G bar. 
uh, they would look like lambda g and lambda r, or lambda lambda h, excuse me. And so what does what happens when you multiply lambda g with lambda h on x? Now what we have to argue is we have to show that when you multiply these things together, so permutation multiplication, we need to show that this is equal to lambda of something, right? And the candidate actually is going to be lambda of g times h. Okay, so when you when you multiply together these permutations, you actually get the permutation associated to the product gh. That's what we want to show right now. Now, how do you show the two functions are equal to each other? You're going to take an arbitrary element of its domain and show that the two functions agree on that element. If the two functions agree on every element in the domain, that means the functions are actually equal to each other. So consider with the left side over here, lambda g of lambda h of x. Well, by function composition, we're just going to put lambda h of x inside of lambda g. Well, lambda h of x just means h times x. Lambda g of anything will just be g times that thing. So we get g times h of x. Well, okay, g times h of x. Well, by associativity, this is going to be g h times x. But hey, that's what just what left translation by g times h does. Left translation by g h. And so that then proves that lambda g times lambda h is equal to lambda of g times h. Therefore, the product of two of these left translations is in fact a left translation. So g bar is closed under multiplication. So we've proven that it's closed under multiplication. So the last thing to prove is that it's closed under inverses. So we need a candidate for the inverse, right? Well, notice here that the identity translation was just to translate the identity. And the product of two translations was equal to the translation of a product. So if I'm going with this, this analog I see right here, it would seem that the inverse of a translation should be the translation by an inverse. So that, that's kind of my conjecture here. So notice what happens. If I take the inverse of one of these things, so this is the inverse of a function, the inverse of a permutation, that's also a permutation. Now notice that uh, g or lambda g to the, the, the inverse function of x this is actually going to map to g inverse of x. How do I know that? Well, notice that, uh, why does that say phi right there? Lambda g of g inverse of x will go, that'll map to g of g inverse x. Whoops. Oh boy, it's falling apart there. Try it again. So lambda g of g inverse of x, well, that you'll get g times g inverse of x, which gives you x, like so. So notice... If we want to pull this thing backwards, right? If we reverse the process, because the inverse function goes the other way around, if g inverse of x maps to x, that means x will map to g inverse of x. Great. But wait a second. g inverse of x is the image of lambda g inverse of x. And so since these two functions agree on all images, all elements in their domain, excuse me, that means they actually are equal to each other. So in particular, what we've shown is that lambda g to the inverse is equal to lambda of g inverse. So our, our set is closed under inverses, and therefore we've proven that g bar is a subgroup of the appropriately sized symmetric group. And so let's see, what do I want to say here? And so this, this argument here, it's this, it's really this argument right here, which is why we define rho g, uh, rho g of x as x g inverse. Because the previous lemma about are these things permutations, those would be permutations. But in order to get uh, g bar to be a subgroup of the symmetric group, uh, the identity would work out the same. Closure under multiplication, you need the inverse map here. Because if you take rho g times rho h of x. Let's actually spell this out for a second. This would look like doing it one step at a time, rho g of rho h of x. You end up with rho g of x h inverse. And then that turns into x h inverse of g inverse. So that looks like x times h inverse g inverse for which that then becomes x times g h to the inverse by the shoe sock principle, uh, which would then look like x, whoops, uh, this would then look like rho of g h of x. So in order to show that this g bar is actually a subgroup, that's why we take the inverse on the right hand side, just so you're aware.
uh, the, the argument is essentially the same left versus right doesn't make much of a difference. So now we've reached Cayley's theorem, where we then we started off with a group G, and then using that group G, we produced a subgroup of the symmetric group. Cayley's theorem then is going to argue that these two groups are the same, that G and G bar are the same. And as G bar is a subgroup of SN, this then proves that every group up to isomorphism is a subgroup of SN. This that is every group can be represented as a group of permutations using use like the Cayley table approach we saw earlier for Z4. All right, so let's prove that this map phi is an isomorphism where the map we're going to send phi of G to lambda sub G. So we'll just send G to left isom uh, left translation. You could also send G to uh, row of G if you prefer right translation. It doesn't matter. We're going to stick with left translation so we don't have to bother with the extra inverse there. So imagine we have two elements of G, okay? So we have phi of G and phi of H. Let's assume they're equal. We want to then prove that this is injective, right? So assume, well, that is we're going to prove injectivity by showing that these that G and H are actually equal to each other. Well, if phi of G equals phi of H, that means lambda G equals lambda H, okay? And then pick an arbitrary element of the group G, like X. Well, if these two functions are equal, that means that their images will be the same for every choice of x. So lambda g of x equals lambda h of x. But what does left translation do? Lambda g of x will give you gx. Lambda h of x will give you hx, like so. And as x here was chosen arbitrarily, we'll just cancel x from the right-hand side, and we end up with g equals h. And therefore, this shows that phi is an injective map. That's the first step, right? To show surjective, this is fairly clear, right? Because the way that we constructed G bar, everything in G bar looks like phi, or excuse me, lambda of G, and therefore G will map onto lambda of G. So surjectivity, ka -chink, it's super easy. Now the homomorphic property, how does this look? Well, we have to show that the product, that phi of, the pro, uh, phi of a product is equal to a product of phi's, all right? So phi of GH, this will look like phi, uh, excuse me, lambda of GH, which we saw in the previous proof that lambda gh is actually the same thing as lambda g times lambda h, which lambda g is just phi of g and lambda h is phi of h. So honestly, my lemmas kind of stole all the thunder be behind Cayley's theorem here, but this gives us the, the, the final proof here that lambda phi is going to, sorry, the lambda phi here is going to be an isomorphism. So the map, g maps over to... Uh, lambda g. This is what we refer to in representation theory as the left regular representation. Oops. Left regular representation of the group. And similarly, if you take g mapping to rho of g, this is what we call the right regular representation. And so that's that's Cayley's theorem. It's pretty, uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty cool. Um, every group can be realized as a subgroup of the symmetric group.